Hello and welcome back everybody to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John. This is episode 241. Uh, so we've been doing this a while now. Uh, shout out to people who helped me behind the scenes you might not know about. Ozzy, thanks for everything for putting these together. And Brian, thank you so much for taking care of everything else. Much appreciated. And a shout out to Laurie Draper who got this idea going in the first place. This is a uh, question and answer format. You ask the questions, I do my best to answer them. If you have a question, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. We start off today with a good question. And honestly, folks, these are some of the best questions I've seen. I've been saying that a lot lately, and it does seem that uh, the clarity of the questions gets better and better every week. So let's get started. Got a question from John. Since retiring from the Navy, I've started a new job which has put a serious dent into my available time to lift. I'm only able to lift on Saturday and Sunday and get several walks with my dog during the week. I'm currently doing Wendler's 531 on a two-day split. So here's my question. Is it possible to increase my military press only pressing once per week? Appreciate any and all suggestions. While I'm happy to increase all of my lifts, my military press is far and away my weakest and the one I want to focus on the most this year. And he's 57, 5'11", 170. So, John, just a, a big swath of an answer right away. Most people's lifts now, the weakest lift they have uh, is the military press. When I was young, uh, it was still being competed. And uh, it was the king and jerk, the clean and jerk was called the king of the lifts. But the press is what everyone kind of fell in love with. I mean, if you look at the pictures of the Olympic lifters in the late 60s, I mean, they they all had those you know the uh, you know those phrases you used to see barnyard wide shoulders and mat you know cannonball deltoids and the titanium traps and the massive triceps the terrible triceps whatever they were so the press I now it could be because uh, you know this the era, era I grew up in so I, I still think the military press is so important. Uh, like most, I fell in love with the bench press and uh, abandoned the military press. And I don't have a ton of regrets, but that might be one of them. Uh, a lot of people don't do the military press anymore. Uh, also called the overhead press. The, you know, I mean, there's a, I don't know why. It, military was always so simple for me. Or the cleaning press. Uh, but a lot of people don't do them. Now, the other thing about the military press is that there's not a lot of ways to nudge it up besides doing presses. Um, you know, there's the old thing about Norm Shemansky being asked about what's the best way to improve your squat? Squat! What's the best way to improve your press? Press! You know, actually, I still think there's great wisdom to that. You want to be a better sprinter? Sprint! Uh, throw or throw! Okay, I'll stop. So, pressing once a week might be an issue. Here's something, John. Here's something, John, I recommend with a lot of my weekend warriors, which you kind of got yourself set into. Um, it might not be a terrible idea that on, like on uh, Saturday, do uh, gyms press and deadlift. Sunday, do the bench press and squat. And then, if you can, fit in midweek, I recommend Wednesday, uh, doing a, a press workout. Um since 531 is a little small on volume, uh, and I think volume helps the military press. If you're to, there, there are certain, there are certain lifts, this, this would be an, an interesting study, that seem to improve with volume. And I've already said two of them, the squat and the press, the military press. Um, uh, I mean, obviously there's always gonna be a combination of volume, intensity, and density on any improving your strength uh, conversation. But those are the two that seem to help most with volume. So you, I mean, if you had to win some contest, I might have you military press five days a week. And, and we probably have a bunch of, you know, accessory auxiliary exercises to support it. That's not going to happen in your case, but you certainly need to press more than once to get your goals. So Wednesday, and I would up the volume on those Wednesday workouts. Um, and the one I like, I, I do that double kettlebell press workout where I go two, three, five, ten, two, three, five, ten. So every time you get through one of those rounds, uh, that's 20 full reps. 
on your Wednesday workouts, you know, taking a lighter load and running through two, three, five, ten a few times, you know, maybe even set the clock and say, I only got 20 minutes, I only got half an hour and see how many rounds you can get. Uh, and you could do that with a strict barbell press. You could do that with kettlebells. You could do it with dumbbells. I'm sure uh, there's someone out there saying, I could do that with handstand push-ups, uh, <laughs> which would be a pretty good effort. Um, that's what I would suggest for you. So the short answer on the military press, uh, almost universally for most people, you need to increase the volume, which means more days a week pressing. And then uh, when you do press, at least one of the workouts has to have some fairly high numbers. Oh boy, at the turn of the millennium, I, I had a goal of clean and pressing 300. And I did it. It's interesting because the program was so simple, but I had a high volume day, mostly eights. And then I had a day where I just kept clean and press, add weight, clean and press, add weight, clean and press, add weight. And strangely, that completely, uh, I don't want to say unscientific, but there's no, I mean, there's not a lot of... It's the least sexy program I've ever said in my life. It got me to my goal. Now, obviously, you have to be able to clean that too. So that was a that was a big deal. But um, yeah, I think the pressers press, and if you can add that one extra day in a week, if you just literally can't do it, then I would do the gyms five three one, and then you know do the military and deadlift on Saturday, the bench and squat on Sunday. And then after that, see if you can get some, some higher volume and lighter military presses just for the practice. You know, in a situation like this, at your age, uh, I think you're gonna find that the military press, uh, actually the combination of those four lifts is really excellent, but you'll find that that military press training is gonna have really nice benefits for your posture, um, uh, maybe to deal with some lagging issues from your past. I think the military press, you know, I've been saying this for way too long, you know, it's still, I think, the best exercise. The cleaning press is the best exercise. You know, question, it comes up, if you could only do one exercise the rest of your life. I almost always say clean and press, or I'll say squat snatch, but, you know, most people would be the clean and press. I, I love the exercise. I think it does marvels for the whole, the whole structure, the whole body. Um, it's strange, but you know, if you if if you're pressing heavy, your feet grab the ground so hard. You, you it you know it's a foot exercise too. It's it's a it's a it's an amazing all around exercise. It chases every quality uh, the clean and press every quality I know that you can get in the weight room, and it's my one stop shop when when in doubt. So thank you, and it's a good question, and and good luck, and get back to me on that. Okay, thank you. I've got a question uh, from Brian. And he even notes here something, but let's let's answer it. What are your thoughts on combining simple and sinister uh, and the rite of passage? So simple and sinister is a program from Pavel. It's in a book called Simple and Sinister. And the rite of passage comes from the book uh, Enter the Kettlebell. And it's one of my favorite training programs ever. It's how I, in the late aughts, is how I got myself ready for kettlebell certs. And I think the program is great. It's clean and presses, basically. Uh, it can be clean and presses, uh, superset with pull-ups. But at the after those clean and press, clean and press with pull-ups, you do either snatches or uh, uh, swings. And I loved it. And I still think uh, it's it's one of the best. It's in that pantheon of a, a handful of kettlebell workouts that I almost universally go, yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. I am currently alternating these. I have been doing this daily for the last several weeks. I go hard four days a week, and the other three are active recovery with a lighter bell. Um, well, you're not doing rite of passage if you're going hard four days a week, and I'm not. I don't know what simple and sinister is, but let me just give some 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 big com comments here. In Pavel's early work, now it changed. The first program minimum he talked about was the kettlebell snatch and the bent press and it was interesting because he even says it in his own books that uh, he didn't realize how jacked up americans were so yeah thank you but uh you know I, uh then there were in you know in power to the people there's also another two exercise program the side press and the uh the uh, the deadlift 
I told Pavel if instead of the side press he'd have uh, written uh, uh, bench press, uh, no one would ever do another program ever. Uh, we'd all be bench press and deadlifting five days a week. Uh, that's a joke. So, but there's another program that he had in in his early books, the second program minimum, where he, you would do swings two days a week and Turkish get-ups two days a week. And I remember Dr. Mike Ch uh, Mark Chang tell me one time that of all the programs, that's the one that people never really truly investigated. And his thought was, we should spend a lot more time. So two days a week, you go into the gym and you do swings. Now I have that 10,000 swing challenge thing, which is, it's, it's a hydra, you know, it just keeps growing and growing. <laughs> you cut off one bad idea and two more sprout out. But the original program, the one uh, that was Group A through Group F programs that Mike Brown and I came up with, um, those still stand the test of time. Um, are, are The one we had in T Nation is still great. But basically what I'm trying to say, Pat Flynn has his 300 swings. Um, if you were to say two days a week, I don't know, pick a number between 100 and 500 and, and do swings, and the other two days a week practice, and I, and I do mean practice, uh, all the movements in the Turkish get-up family. If you take a cert, you'll learn all these little drills uh, that tie into the whole Turkish get-up. And, and I often think that some of those drills, uh, because you might do, like I have one called the Rolling 45. If you do, you know, 10 to 20 on each side, you walk away with this feeling. <laughs> you can see me. It's funny how I'll talk, and, and it's sad for the, those listening. I do the movement sometimes as I'm talking, which isn't, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense, but two days a week you do the Turkish get up and two days a week you do swings. And I love that workout and it was never truly explored. From there, after you got to a certain level of competence, uh, you would slide over to the rite of passage, which is clean and press and uh, the pull-ups and the swings or snatches at the end. And you were supposed to have a heavy day, a light day and a medium day, three days a week. Uh, I followed the program as written. Uh, I've mentioned many times in the podcast that the day, so I only had a 28 kilo kettlebell. And so the day I did the ladder, so let, let me review right a passage for those. You don't know it. So I'll just give you the hardest day, uh, what, what you're building up to. So you clean and press left the 28 once. You clean and press right the 28K once or whatever you have. You do one pull up. Clean and press twice, clean and press twice, right hand, two pull-ups. Three clean and press left, three clean and press right, three pull-ups. Four clean and press left, four clean and press right, four pull-ups. Five clean and press left, five clean and press right, five pull-ups. And you're expected to do five rounds of that for a total of uh, 75 clean and press left, 75 clean and press right, 75 pull-ups and then step back and either snatch or swing, depending on the day. Um, I'm not sure what the original program said, but I found for me, I, I put my snatches on the light day and I did my swings on the, the heavy and medium day. And one of the reasons I did that is because I, the light day, I always felt like I needed something a little bit harder to finish with. And the snatch to me is harder than the swing. Love that program. Uh, I have some friends who have been doing it a long time. Um, one of my buddies is an RKC in California, and he uh, he told me a little. We had a little, we haven't seen each other once. So we had a little email exchange about that's still his foundational program, and I'm I'm thinking we're looking up on decades he's been doing that, which is pretty impressive. So for me, I still think the program minimum and the rite of passage in order. Program minimum with the swing uh, Turkish getup, followed by the rite of passage, you know, until you pass, you know, whatever that, you know, until you pass that. And then for me, I would prefer you went into double kettlebell work. Uh, here on my podcast, we talk a lot about the armor building complex, which is the two kettlebells, two cleans, one press, three front squats. After the rite of passage, you've been doing so many pull-ups and presses that shifting over to the more squats, it seems to be a good thing. More squats and more heavy squats seems to be a good thing. Um, it would be a fun challenge to see somebody do two weeks of program minimum. I don't know, 
two to four weeks of rite of passage, uh, maybe four weeks of uh, armor building the way I teach it. Um, two times the first week, one time the second, two times the third week, one time uh, the fourth week. And you mix uh, on the other days, you do a lot of uh, a lot of military presses with the kettlebells. Um, what you're doing uh, is a lot. If, if I understand the programs, um, you're, so what you're doing, and this is why it took so long to get there, Brian, is that you're doing uh, the program minimum, you're doing the old program minimum and the rite of passage uh, back to back all, all at once. So you're doing those five big exercises, the swing, the swing, the Turkish get up, the clean, the press, the pull up, um, and that's great, but um, you know that's that's not how the workouts are prescribed, and I'm fine with that because you don't learn anything unless you you know you you nudge out those barriers a little bit. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how you're pulling it off. Personally, I would I, I like to do more of one experiment at a time. Therefore, I can kind of get a sense of what's working versus what's not working. But uh, I like it. I, I think there's some insights to it. Personally, I'd rather see you do the traditional program minimum, the rite of passage followed by the ABC. But, uh, you know, your experiment seems interesting to me. Uh, let me know how it goes. Uh, I'd be interested in it. Maybe if you could send in a more uh, detailed thing about what you're doing weekly, I can do a better job answering in the future. Okay. Thank you. I, I like what it is. What we see is Okay. Our next question is from Tom and Tom does a good thing. He, uh, I write, a, I have, you know, articles back, you know, three decades. Uh, I have workshops, notes back in when I first started doing strength and throwing workshops back in the early 1980s. Uh, so sometimes, you know, <laughs> I can't believe I'm about to say is that, you know, my, what I said something 40 years ago, very often I still, oh, that's a really good point. And then I have to remind myself about it. Some of the stuff doesn't date well. Like I remember I used to really, because of a book, uh, the, uh, Ken Cooper came out with a revised model of his book aerobics and he recommended vitamin C and vitamin E. And I remember being on a kick there for a while to make sure all my athletes took vitamins and C and E. And by the way, not, those are fine. But I, I for, this is back when the free radical discussion, uh, free radicals in, in your bloodstream, not in the uh, Chicago seven or anything, but, uh, haha. Uh, there are some things I look back and go, oh, I don't know about that. And most of the time, yeah, that's okay. So whenever you bring up something from the past, uh, I have to rethink a few things. I know you suggest that we go out for a walk every day for 30 minutes or so. Now, that's my suggestion. And that's probably the suggestion of most, most longevity people now, the importance of walking, uh, whether you read the Blue Zone stuff or Sinclair's work or Tony Robbins has a book on life extension. Uh, Atia has one. Uh, my, my favorite is, I, my two favorites are uh, uh, Longo's Longevity Diet, Walter Longo's Longevity and Gifford's uh, Spring Chicken. They're, they're all, they're all, they all get around the idea of walking daily. Here's my question. I saw an old T Nation article you did on inefficient exercise for fat loss. So my point has always been, and let me help out Tom with the point here. Um, I think the key, one of the keys to fat loss is exercise. Now, the new research is the exercise burn numbers are all probably well overstated, probably to double. And it's going to be a weird thing to try to explain, but some of the new research is saying that what we consider the calorie burn thing, you know, I'm going to go out and I've got this little thing from a book that says, you know, I burn 100 calories an hour doing this thing. So if I did that thing, I would burn a pound of fat in 35 hours. Well, now there's an argument that those numbers are largely overinflated. And the number more like would be 70 hours of exercise. Well, okay, then, you know, as many people are going to, you know, whenever I talk about diet and exercise, I get a whole bunch of comments that basically say it's all caloric restriction. And there's no question caloric restriction is true, but 
trust me, there's enough variations in, in the human body that some people, if they ate 2,500 calories a day of just simple sugar, um, you wouldn't want to, let's just say you wouldn't want to be in a room with them. Uh, other people can thrive on keto. Other people can thrive on vegan. Other people, you know, it, it's weird what works for people. And, and I think a lot of our listeners would probably nod and go, yeah, that's, that's true. Um, when it comes to exercise, one of the issues is this. As you do exercises and you get better and better and better, the hit on your metabolism doesn't, uh, doesn't burn hotter. What do I mean by this? Uh, and I always use the example of my neighbor. He doesn't ride his bike anymore, but he used to have this bike and he had an aerodynamic helmet and he had aerodynamic gloves and he had this high tech bike. And he used to wear this white spandex suit, which men should probably not wear. But he also had a really big belly. And my thought was when I watched him go by one time, and this is not a knock on my uh, neighbor. We've actually, I've actually talked to him about this and he's okay with it. Um, when I ride my bike, my bike is a cruiser. It's got one speed, it has coaster brakes. It weighs about 90 pounds. If it, it's actually difficult to carry my bike up the back, uh, the flight of stairs in my back. It's heavy, okay? And it hits the, the guardrails as you go up. But if I ride my bike 100 miles and he rides his bike 100 miles, I'm going to burn a lot more calories, even if I'm in the best shape of my life. Because if I come to a hill, a hill, if I come to a, a you know, like, you know, your driveway, it's got that little bump like that. I got to get out of my bike and go, uh, uh. he could probably pedal two times and coast uh, 30 miles on his bike. It is high tech. So the more efficient that his bike became, the less and less he had to burn. Make sense? So if you're a horrible swimmer, swimming is an outstanding way for you to burn calories. Also, there's something magical about being in a cold pool that burns even more calories. And if you've ever gone swimming uh, at Salt Hill uh, in uh, Galway Bay, you know what cold is. Uh, it might be the coldest I've ever been in my life. Um, but swimming in, in Salt Hill with uh, my good friend, Adrian Craddock, you know, when you're going out there for five, six, 10 minutes, you know you're burning fat for the rest of the day because you're out there in the ocean, you're getting knocked around by the waves and it's, it's the water's coming off the Arctic. And, you know, it, it sure feels like that. So if you're not a very good swimmer, when you do a length of a pool, you get to the other side and you're, <sighs> as you get better and better and better, smooth your stroke smooths out you get the you know the bilateral breathing going you 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 wear the the high tech clothes you've got the glasses you've got the fins you've got the suit you got the as you get better and better and better yes you can go farther and farther but you have to to burn the same amount of cal calories versus when you were one step from drowning when you first learned so a, a crappy bicycle probably makes you work harder than a good bicycle uh, poor swimming technique makes you work harder. There's a show, I didn't, there, you know, I wasn't a huge friend, uh, fan of Friends, but there is an episode where Phoebe runs funny and the other character, the Jennifer Aniston character, doesn't want to run with her. Well, the funny thing about the way Phoebe runs is probably for fat loss, she's probably doing the right thing. People make, and we still get, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, Leonard Schwartz's heavy hands. I'll tell you why people don't do heavy hands. You look like a lunatic when you do it. You know, you're walking around my neighborhood. You got those three pound weights and you're pumping them as high as you can. It's a very inefficient way of getting around, but it's a much more efficient way of burning fat. He then asks, would it be perhaps be better to alternate days of 30 minute walking with swimming, rowing, biking, or other cardio machines at the gym, similar to how you recommend varying the load carry exercise at the end of the workout? That way we will never get too efficient at any of them. Tom, I really like that idea. You know, they got that weird uh, cross-country ski machine and they got the rowing machine and they got the, the bike that's got the thing like, you know, you, where you use your hands, which is, by the way, Clarence Bass, his books are there. You know, he's a real fan of that bike, the, the one, so you pedal and you use your arms at the same time. Sometimes he just uses his arms. Sometimes he just uses his right arm, left arm, right foot only, left foot only. You can do a, a lot of things to make it harder for you. 
Yeah, I like that idea. In fact, if you can handle it, I think it's genius. Now, when I go to a public gym, usually what I see people do is uh, adjusting their music on their phone while walking at about two miles an hour or you know, even less. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about you hopping on the uh, the exercise bike, you know, and, and going for it. Um, my caveat on this, Tom, is that I, I would worry that you would go a little too high with your heart rate. Uh, do your best to uh, try to manage. Uh, I mean, you, it would be it, it'd be a real fun study for you, real simple one. But to have a heart rate monitor on, whatever kind, mine go in my ears. I also have one that goes around my chest. Um, and just kind of, there's so many little programs you can do this with your phone now. But, you know, just get your phone as far, as far away as you can and then do the workout. And then before you even look at your heart rate numbers, give yourself a rate of perceived exertion for the workout. You know, maybe it you know, maybe, and maybe even a, a journal style, like, you know, I, I went for half an hour. The first 10 minutes were really easy. I went too hard on, you know, I felt crappy at 15. Uh, I got my moment, you know, I got it, things geared back up at, you know, minute 20 at minute 25. I just started counting the seconds and I couldn't wait to be done. Um, maybe on the, I, I think it's called an aerodyne, maybe on the aerodyne, that's what you get. And on the, on the, on the rower, maybe you have, Felt great the entire time, and then look at your heart rates with what you you perceive. It would be an interesting thing to see because there are times when you do a heart rate thing that your perceived exertion is much higher than what's showing on on the heart rate monitor. Uh, you might find that with uh, if you ever find yourself in a dangerous situation or water, um, your body might have been you know in a panic mode, but. Uh, your, your systems were running kind of smoothly. I, that's just an example from my own life. Okay, he then adds the important word, better. To follow up on this, the first thing is, let's just make sure we take a moment to think about the word better again, Tom. Is it better? You know, all we have to do, we have to do the test, the trials, and see. If you do five different cardiovascular exercises in a week and your joints feel great, and you pop out of bed and everything's going great, and then it is better. Uh, many people will find that if you just do one kind of, uh, l you know, longer, slower training, you know, your joints will pick up the, the ouchies, um, depending on what you decide. Um, there, are, there are issues with swimming, you need a pool. Uh, there are issues with cross-country skiing, you need snow, and you know, where I live, you gotta live where I live. And then you got to drive up to we can do cross country skiing because uh, the snow melts too quickly here. One of the more interesting things that you didn't mention, and I would like I mentioned heavy hands, but the other thing I want to mention, just kind of out, uh, is I, I still think rollerblading is is one of the most underappreciated gems in cardiovascular training, especially for the bigger lifter. Okay, now there's some issues, you know, if, if you're worried about looking silly with heavy hands, you know, some of the outfits we saw when rollerblading first came out, you know, but you know, you should, you really should wear a helmet. Uh, I like those wrist guards that have the piece of metal here. So you can kind of, if you fall forward, you can skid. Uh, whether you need elbow and knee pads is kind of up to you. Um, when I used to do it on the Jordan River Parkway, and it was a long, long run. Uh, everything was pretty safe. I never had to worry about anything because if something bad did happen, I almost always went forward. But I will be honest, those wooden bridges with the family with 600 kids at the bottom, they wouldn't move. Trying to wiggle your way through, you know, a one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, and five-year-old going down a wooden, a wooden bridge is pretty dangerous. Those were the times I wish I had elbow and knee pads. But yeah, uh, rollerblading is amazing. Um, I still think it's fairly low impact unless you fall. And that's why you need all that extra gear. But yeah, a good question. And uh, so just kind of keep a couple of things in mind for all of you who, who are who are listening about fat loss. We do need to strive for inefficient exercise. And that's why the thing I do whenever I go for a walk, I always wear a weight vest because I used to weigh. So one of the things I try to do, I call, I call it reverse rucking is that as I lose weight, 
I try to keep the same amount of inefficiency in my walking. So if, if you put yourself on a program, you lose 40 pounds. I don't necessarily think you need to wear a 40 pound vest, but you know, if you wore a 20 pound vest, you would still get some of the benefits you got when you weighed more. This is a whole question unto itself and maybe I'll save it for another time. But so you still want to keep your cardiovascular work a bit inefficient. That's why on my most of my walks after I lift, I do uh, carry weights in my hands. I've got twos, threes, fives, eights, tens, and then 25 if you really want to find out if you're tough or not. Go for a long walk, actually heavy handing 25s. It's very difficult. Tens are brutal. So you want to keep inefficiency into your cardiovascular training. Now, obviously, you're competing. Ignore everything I just said. Um, when it comes to the weight room, you want to be as efficient as you can. When it comes to the cardiovascular benefits, you want to be as inefficient as you can. Uh, I hope that helped. Tom, that's a fun question. And thanks for reminding me of that uh, uh, from back in the day. And you'll, yeah, I still like those old T Nation articles I wrote. So it's, yeah. So speaking of weightlifting, Ken picks up with one of our favorite topics of recent times. I know you've covered the armor building complex from so many angles, and thank you for your endless attention to this topic. Ken, I answer the questions as they come in, so I guess I have to answer what you like, yeah. I'm currently 39, I've been trained with kettlebells for three years. I'm now looking to set a three month target to achieve with the ABC. I love three month programs, by the way, and I don't get bored easily. Ken, there's a chance by the time this uh, comes out that my new book, uh, on uh, the armor building complex will, will have come out. What's sweet about that is that uh, the armor building complex, at least a couple of the programs, come right around three months, and it's a good one. I currently do the ABC with double 20 kilo bells every minute on the minute for 12 minutes. By that point, my heart rate has gone uh, gradually climbed to about 150. So you're 39. Um, yeah, yeah, that's 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 high, but not bad for 12 minutes. Uh, um, but that's fine. And I'm also feeling enough fatigue in my muscles that if I kept going, I'd probably risk deteriorating form. And and thank you for stopping well before that happens. My gut tells me double 24 bells for 30 minutes is achievable. Yes, it is. After three months of work, but does that sound too ambitious for someone who's building up to that level for the first time in his life? What additional key information is still missing to help me make a determination? So one of the things I want to share with you in the new book, I talk about, so there are weeks where we, so just real simple, and I'll just, I'll do it as basic as I can. Week one, you do the ABC twice. There's going to be someone asking, what's the ABC? So let me tell you, but armor building complex, two kettlebells, double kettlebells. You do two cleans, one press three front squats, put the weight down. A, B, C, armor building complex. Um, week one, you go twice. Week two, you go once. Week three, you go twice. Week four, you go once. On the once weeks, so the, on weeks uh, two and four, those are the weeks I'd like you to extend those minutes out. So you're currently at, uh, I got you at 12. So next time you come up, uh, on say it's the Wednesday workout, middle workout of the week, whatever it is. Um, I want you to build up to 13 minutes and maybe even try 15 minutes. The following week, I want your two ABC workups to tally up more than that Wednesday single workout. So if you went, let me just jump ahead for 20 minutes because the math is just a little bit easier with, for me. If you did 20 minutes on uh, week two, uh, uh, every minute on the minute with the 20s on week three, two workouts. And I'd like to see you try something like maybe 10 minutes on the Monday workout, 15 minutes on the other workout. It could also be uh, 12 and eight. It could be it could be 15 and something less. I wouldn't say five. That Well, it's an option. I shouldn't d deny it. But if you went 15 and 10, now you're at 25 minutes for the week, which is a big jump, you know, but still not a bad idea. So if you're trying to up the ABC numbers, try that method. So basically on the single weeks, 
those are the that's the tough workout. That's the workout where you're really trying to attack more numbers. And that's the idea. Uh, when you walk in, you say, okay, my best is uh, I want to get to uh, 30 minutes with the with the 12 uh, with the 20s. I want to get to 30, and I'm at 15 now. Okay, so this week I'm going to do. I'm going to try for 16. If 16 feels good, I'll go to 17 and then natural cutoff. The next week, you look at that 16, 17, 18, kind of divide by two and then hedge the numbers a little bit. If it's 17, then you might want to go uh, 10 and 8 the next week or something like that. So you basically add up plus a little bit on the doubles weeks. I know this is a lot of math, but it makes sense when you do it. Uh, it will seem like what I'm telling you to do is this. Wednesdays are your heavy days. The following week, you have a medium and an easy day. Yes, that's true. But what you're trying to do is nudge that Wednesday workout up. That's why I think it takes about, well, you gave you gave yourself a great time, uh, three months. I mean, that gives you, I mean, that gives you six opportunities to go one, two, one, two, one, two. One day a week, two days a week, one day a week, two days a week, one day a week, two days a week. And when you accumulate all those reps up, I think that'll trend you in the right direction. Ken, personally, when I look at your goal, uh, I wouldn't mind seeing you try to get that double 20s first at 30 minutes. And I think what you're going to find, it's only going to take a couple of weeks to get the double 24s in the 30 minutes too. It'll take you a little while to get up there at the double 20s, the accumulated volume. It won't take you nearly as long to match those 20s with the 24. I can't tell you how long that's going to be. You know, it's one of those your mileage may vary kind of things. But it's a it's a good goal, and I like what you said here. Thank you. That's very good. Carl asks a question that's really a question I, I, I deal with more and more in my career now. My big question for you is around goal setting. Now, before I even get started, I want to make sure, folks, that <laughs> if you pay me money to help you, we will talk about goal achievement much more than goal setting. I make the same joke all the time. You know, what are your goals? I want to ride a unicorn. Oh, okay, that, that's, that's a great goal. Um, but there's a problem, you know, if, you know, uh, we've got green alligators and, and long geese, some humpy back camels and some chimpanzees, some rats and bats and elephants. And sure, as you're born, don't you forget the, we don't have unicorns, okay? So even though you can say that as a goal, there's no meat behind it, okay? Um, I get this a lot, you know, with uh, high school kids, they want to play in the National Basketball Association, uh, be Mr. Olympia, and, you know, fly to the moon. I mean, that's, that's, those are all achievable goals. Those are all different to do, uh, difficult to do. So how do you approach goal setting in the absence of an upcoming competition? How do you determine the priority and internal validity of these goals? Boy, in, in other words, um, he's, this is what Carl's saying. Dan, would you give me everything you do in the 12 weeks of the inner circle that you spend hours every week helping people with? How do you determine the priority and internal validity of these goals? That's a tough one. Okay. I know you've talked about it some in your lectures, but it's something in which I've been struggling. For example, I want to get stronger, so should I bulk or at least eat enough food, but I want to get leaner, so should I cut, but I don't want to lose strength. Uh, thank you, Carl, for your candid honesty there. I, I just love it. This this is the most common. Uh, I want to be the you know I want to be the biggest strongest man in the world, but I want you know I want to be four percent body fat, and I want to you know high jump eight feet. Well, okay, yeah, I don't think you could do them all. I ended up I ended up doing a bit of everything, which does very little to accomplish any of the goals. Isn't that true? You know if you if you, what do they say, minor in the majors, it's real tough. I've tried to set goals, but I find that I often work against myself. Tell me what I am settling down on paper is different from what is my head. Do you have any advice for how to prioritize goals? Well, okay, so this is what we do in the inner circle. So I'll give you a summary. I, I, I certainly can't give you, I mean, because I don't have the time to give you everything, but let me give you some big ones. 
Brian Gwaltney gave me this assignment a couple years ago. We're having a conversation about what should I do in my life. Um, and he said, you should write out your perfect day. And it was fascinating because later I shared with my friend Patrick, I said, yeah, he said, write out your perfect day. And Patrick said to me, well, what's your perfect day? And I said, well, I don't get up with an alarm clock. And we both kind of laughed for a minute. And then he said, explain that. And, and then I basically explained that for me, for me to get up without an alarm clock means I went to bed at a reasonable hour. I made my to-do list. Uh, I got coffee set for when I wake up in the morning. I wake up to the smell of coffee. Um, it's not really an alarm clock, um, but it works. Um, I, 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 you know, I didn't, I wasn't an idiot the night before. You know, I didn't drink three bottles of Jack Daniels. <laughs> um, I went to bed at a decent hour. I got a great night's sleep. I woke up. Uh, after I, I woke up, I started my day. This isn't coffee. It's a uh, delicious tea. But uh, I started my day with a cup of coffee, a glass of water. Uh, I, I looked at my to-do list. I took care of one or two items I might need to do. Boom, boom, boom. That's how, to me, my perfect day um, was so simple in my head. And I just kind of went through. And then the idea is that most of my days, and this is going to sound kind of mean to some, for some people, but most of my days are perfect days. So on the back of my computer here, and I've talked about it before online, I have this thing called my pirate map, a phrase I get from Pat Flynn. And a pirate map is, you know, go to St. John's Island, find the white coconut tree, take seven paces to the west, dig down, there's the sunken treasure. A pirate map is a list of about five, you can go up to eight things that you're going to do each and every day. Number one for me starts the night before. I make my to-do list. I make coffee. I review my two big goals, which will come back. I'll do it right now. I don't believe that you can have, I have a lot of goals in my life, true, but I have two big goals. And if I take care of those two big goals, everything else uh, works. My, I have a financial goal and I have a physical goal. If I'm taking care of those two, um, you know, I want to dance at Josephine's wedding, my, uh, my granddaughter. Well, if I take care of my financial goals and my physical goals, those wind up 20 years from now, me dancing at her wedding. Uh, we'll come back to those in a minute. Uh, but even before we get into the perfect day, as we step back from the perfect day, and you, you have yours, I have mine. Now we throw some, we throw some things at it. First off, does that fit with your values? And one of the first assignments we do in the inner circle is a values assignment. Now, listen, a lot of people fall back and say, my values are faith and family. And listen, there are some people who I'll allow that with. I've got a few people in my life, but sometimes you just say that because it's nice. And when you say my values are faith and family, everyone goes, ah. Uh. You know, I took mine very seriously. My two key values are order and fitness. And it cracked me up because it took me a long time to realize that I've been in love with fitness and weightlifting and all this stuff since 1965. I've been in love with it. And if you know anything about me, order is a big thing in my life. I declutter. I, of course, I look at my desk right now and I go, that's not very ordered. And I have to be careful because now my brain wants to clean my desk. But if when I coach people, they always think everything's just kind of fun and storytelling and laughs. And then other coaches will watch and go, oh my God, you went through a list of 75 things. Right, because that's the way my brain works. Those, those are my two key values. So do my values support my pirate map? Well, first off, my pirate map goes in order. One, I wake up, you know, a uh, 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 night before, you know, I do the night before things. Two, I wake up, I meditate, I drink my coffee. Uh, at every meal, I, I, I try to eat eight different vegetables every day. At every meal, I eat vegetables. I lift weights three days a week. I ruck one day a week. I do an hour of tonic work, original strength one day a week. I walk daily. The last one is try every day to make a difference in the world. Make a difference. Okay. I do those in order. You know, uh, most of them are about fitness. If I take care of my fitness and I do things when I'm supposed to do them, that takes care of my business. The next thing after that uh, is your habits. Now, I'm a big believer in something called shark habits. I got that from Rob Wolf. And it's the idea of one bite and it's gone. For those of you who email me, you know, I email you right back. You call me on the phone. I call you right back. You text me. I text you right back. 
because that is a shark habit for me. Uh, my athlete, uh, one of my athletes the other day asked me about why I always wear these black V-neck shirts. And I said, well, because I have almost uh, 26 of them as my last count, but there were some in the, in the dryer. Um, I buy these shirts, they're very inexpensive, so I don't have to think. And if I don't have to think about what I'm wearing, that frees up some of my brain space to uh, coach you better as an athlete or uh, be a better neighbor, or be a better dad or grandfather. So my habits support, my habits support my perfect day. Um, Coach Mon told me in 1977, make yourself a slave to good habits. And I've never heard any better advice in my life than that, <laughs> ever. Uh, it's just an absolute truism. And then the next thing we talk about is what is your X? And I always do that with X. Uh, for those of you listening, I'm making an X with my forms. Uh, everybody has that thing in their life that is their kind of their curse. Uh, I, every, mine changes. Uh, recently, I found myself scrolling a lot. And the reason I noticed that um, is that people pointed out to me and I just caught myself and I said, how did I do that? How did I go from really never scrolling on my phone to start scrolling? Well, it's because those your your social media things are designed to hold your brain in there. Uh, and as smart as I think I am, I couldn't overcome it. Uh, couldn't overcome it. So for me to deal with too much scrolling, I bought myself uh, a couple of cheap watches that look good with my uh, various clothes. Uh, very inexpensive, very reasonable. And because I'd noticed, I often use my phone to tell time. So I also sprinkle around the house some things called clocks. I make the joke all the time. Yes, you young people wouldn't know what that is. But uh, with watches and clocks, I don't open my phone to find out what time it is. I go like this. Um, maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's a kind of, maybe it's red wine. Maybe it's a, uh, it's the candy bowl in your office. Maybe it's a certain donut shop that's near your, your, your house. Find out what your X is and do your best. Then you run that X, you run those habits through your perfect day. If you tell me alcohol is your problem, let's just say, uh, alcohol is my problem. I know when I drink, uh, I, when I drink, I get fat. When I drink, I get mean, I get, well, whatever it is. And your perfect day is I wake up and I have a Bloody Mary with my feet up on a couch and then I have mimosas and then at noon, it's beers at noon with my friends and then the afternoon starts at three. We have white wine at three, like this. Uh, rose at four and uh, uh, dark uh, red wines at five. And then after that, very expensive scotches. Well, <laughs> your your ex is in the way of your perfect day. Your habits can be in the way of your perfect day. And then, of course, your standards and values and everything else can be in the way of your perfect day. So for me, goal setting starts off with you telling me what is your perfect day. Then, okay, hold on, I'm getting there. Then we do the 5-2 assignment where we talk about what are your goals two decades from now, two years from now, two months from now, and then of course where the pirate map shows up and shark habits, today and tomorrow. All this is in my goal achievement course in danjohnuniversity.com. Well, the bulk of it is. I mean, a lot of this stuff changes. The better I get at it, the better I, the more I add. After you do the perfect day, after you kind of wash through your values, you wash it through your standards, you wash it through your habits, your what your X is, when you think about yourself two decades from now, two years from now, two months from now, today and tomorrow, then we kind of fold our arms like this and we go, we nod, you know, got to fold your arms. You got to do that knowing nod. You got to look at each other. And and then we say, okay, does, if you got your body weighed up, you bulked up to 350 pounds. So you, you, you'd be the strongest guy in, you know, in that the Murray rec center weight room, is that, does that tie into your goals two decades from now? Well, I don't know. <laughs> That's a question two years from now. Um, if you want to be a Division One athlete and you're a sophomore in high school listening to me right now, two years from now, you will be uh, either on your way to your goal or not going to your goal, and you're going to have to change plans. One of the nice things about doing this kind of look into the future kind of assignment so the 5-2 is you're kind of looking into the future 
And then the perfect day is what you think presently is a perfect day for you. But then you, you, you link back to, well, what are my values? What, why do I think that's important? Here are some lessons from my past that I kind of need to pay a little bit of attention to, you know, and you just kind of, you kind of march through it a little bit. So your, your values, your X and all your habits will inform yourself today about your perfect day. And the nice thing is, and, and this is something I really try to emphasize to people, is it's your perfect day. It's yours. And my perfect day is not the same as yours. My perfect day involves, you know, playing trivia with my daughter and my, my team. Uh, my perfect day involves hanging out with Meryl and Joyce at the senior center uh, at the Thursday night dance, you know, and, and all of our friends there. And, you know, my perfect day involves, you know, taking the dogs for a walk or dealing with my beehives. Not a lot of that. And of course, the ability to travel when I feel like it and, and enjoy travel when I do it. So I would spend a little bit of time thinking about all these things and then do the full germ thing, the, the knowing nod thing and say, okay, and I can almost guarantee if you get a chance that you'll have clarity on, on what you want. And once you know what you want, man, that makes it a lot easier to get it. Now it's true. If you want a Nobel Prize or a Pulitzer or an Oscar or, you know, those things get voted on in life, that's going to be tough. But anything that's not voted on is pretty achievable. Obviously, an Olympic gold medal or a world record is going to be tough too, but you hang around long enough and you can break a gold medal at least, I mean, you can break a world record. Like if you stick around long enough in track and field, yeah, you could be the the fastest 100-year-old, you know, 1,500-meter uh, runner in the world. You got the world record uh, if you hang in there long enough. So I hope that helps. That was a lot of explanation, a lot of time. But boy, I think it's worth it. Um, I know a lot of people don't listen the full way through um, uh, some of my things I say. You know, we can see it with the, you know, uh, the numbers on the thing. But this is one of those ones. Uh, it's worth your time to consider, think about. Uh, go to danjohnuniversity.com, take the goal setting class, um, maybe even reach out and join the inner circle. I mean, there's some, there's some tools I've shared with you very quickly that really can make, uh, can give you a lot of clarity and, and simplify goal achievement for you. That's my goal <laughs> and goal achievement is to make it simpler for you to achieve them. Thank you. A good question. Bill asks a question. Your recent podcast on training by seasons prompted two questions in my mind. My overall goal is to be uh, to be lean, fit man approaching 60, which is a good goal. Um, I'm a big believer that from ages 35 to 55, that's when you make your biggest investment on the fu your future health, fitness, and longevity. The, the stronger, fitter, leaner, whatever all that means you are going in, to the point after 55 is the best investment you can make for your physical body. Financially, the best investment you can make is graduate from high school, graduate from college, um, take all your high school graduation money, invest it into a, a, a long-term retirement account, never look at it again, and then be amazed when you're 67. Um, but let's get with your question. Um, with a sub goal of getting ready for ski season in January, February every year, what would you recommend as my order of goals across the year? Well, there's some. There's a really good book uh, that I uh, may have lain, uh, lent out. But when cross country ski skating for show, uh, the Bill Koch invention of skating for cross country skiing, uh, I got a good book on year round periodization for cross country skating, and I really like that book. But one of the things I think, I'm going to give you a couple ideas. Um, in the off season, as best you can, you, you need to find a tool that helps you uh, maintain your overall health. And I'm going to tell you, because I already mentioned it today, there's a couple of things. In a, but number one, I, I think in the summer months, uh, obviously in the tradition of skiing, everybody bicycled. That was a big thing to do. But I think bicycling, rollerblading, and rollerblading are the two of the best things you can do to keep yourself in very good shape. And I'm not just talking about cardiovascular, but actually the, 
the, those prime movers for uh, for for skiing. Um, the, the university I, I coach at, we have an outstanding, outstanding ski team. Uh, uh, Utah University of Utah and Westminster uh, uh, here in Salt Lake are two schools that are, you know, they're just like a discus throw across from each other, but two phenomenal ski teams. Um, and I, I actually talked to some of the athletes and, and they, they say one of their advantages that they have is that they, they do take that stuff very seriously. Um, they, I watch them play pickup basketball games. They play soccer. Um, they do a lot of general fun conditioning that I think gets avoided by a lot of other skiers. Um, so I would just tell you this. So as I would ski as late into the season as I can here in Utah, you know, nobody shows up this time of year, but the ski, it's the best time of year to ski in the spring. The resorts are empty. It's much cheaper. And the snow is the best of the year. S ski as late as you can. And then once it all starts to dry up, the nice thing too is now the weather starts to open up so you can go outside and you can do all the other events. Uh, honestly, uh, I mean, basic triathlon training, the swimming, biking, uh, running uh, in the summer, get out there, have some fun, go for some distance. Um, get out there in the summer and just rollerblade as much as you can. Um, and enjoy things. I think uh, trail bicycling, uh, uh, I don't even know what we call it. We call it BMX for a while. But you know, those, you know, off road bicycling might be one of the best things. Please wear a helmet uh, and a protective gear as, as appropriate. I, I, I think that is just a wonderful way to train. Now, once the season starts getting close, your ski season, then I would get yourself onto a disciplined weight training program three days a week. I don't know if it matters if it's barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells, but a disciplined training program and continue doing as much as you can, the bicycling, the other the other events you, you feel like doing. Pick and choose, you know, don't, don't, and do them all. Uh, this book here, Dr. Bob Arnott's Guide to Turning Back the Clock. It's over two decades old now, but he really, uh, if you can find a copy of it, um, it's really a good book. He, he, uh, he talks about all these things in the book. And as you, and he would recommend machine training with power cleans, which I found interesting. Uh, machine based training, a little bit more hypertrophy work, keep yourself healthy. And I think that combination is the best. And when it's time for you to go skiing, man, get up there and ski. Get up there on the slopes and enjoy it. Um, I would say you're in season the day you get on the slopes the first time. Um, and if you've done the warm months of all that fun cardiovascular swimming, biking, rollerblading, running, whatever, walking, uh, anything else you can think of, enjoy it. Probably six to 12 weeks of three days a week lifting, plus the other stuff as best you can fit it in. Take a day or two to get yourself ready to ski again and then just enjoy. Um, I hope I, uh, I hope that helps. When I was young, that's how everybody trained for every sport. And now I feel like I'm speaking a different language when I'm on talk to most athletes today. So thank you, Bill. Good question, okay? Joshua asks a good question. I'm a 37-year-old police officer who about a year ago gave up a gym membership for a set of kettlebells and an exercise bike. That's a good home gym right there. I only wish I'd have done it years ago because it has fixed my shoulders and lower back and I feel healthier and more athletic than I probably in 15 years. Well, that's high praise for the kettlebell and the exercise bike. With that said, if I pretty much only did swings, cleans, jerks, snatches, and front squats, along with walks, bike rides, and mobility work, do you see any glaring deficiencies in that? Also, I hear you talk about the clean and Let's answer that first question first, because oh, this is going to take us in a different route. Swings, cleans, jerks, snatches, and front squats. I would probably only say, Joshua, uh, instead of the jerks, I would do the presses uh, with the kettlebells. So swings, cleans, presses, snatches, and front squats. Uh, I think, yeah, you're not missing anything. Uh, that's a good training program. Uh, weirdly, people will ask me, well, there's no biceps or pec work in that. And I'm always like... Um, the kettlebell clean is an ideal bicep work from the standpoint of how the bicep uh, works if you take an anatomy class. Um, I have an article on it called uh, uh, 
the cardio clean workout or something like that, where I go through in de details. No, I like this very much. Um, I would suggest for you to keep the armor building complex in there. Someone always asks a question. Um, double kettlebells, two cleans, one press, three front squats. I would keep that in uh, just because as a police officer, there is a need for some armor uh, to, you know, if you have to roll, if you have to, you know, get on the ground, you'll be glad you did some of this stuff. With the snatches and the swings, I think there's real uh, value to you using those. Um, I would probably move away from the snatches. Uh, you mentioned you have shoulder issues, so maybe snatches is something you do. Um, you have like a practice session one week, the next session, the next week you have a, you know, a, a little bit more of a targeted harder session. Next, next week, practice session, you know, keep the reps five to 10 reps, practice the move, stay well within your range, you know, with the, your tolerance, uh, practice, go a little harder, practice, go a little harder, practice, go a little harder. And the swings might be the best warm up and cool down exercise you could possibly do. Okay, I love it. He then says, also, I hear you talk about the clean and press a lot, but seemingly not as much about the clean and jerk. Given your background in Olympic lifts, I was wondering if there's a reason for that. I personally pr prefer the jerk over the press because I like the explosive element and it also seems easier on the shoulders, but I'd love to know your take on it. Oh, it's not that I'm uh, against the, the... Now, if we're talking about the kettlebell clean and jerk, my, my only issue with the kettlebell clean and jerk is there is a there's a teaching, there's a timing and teaching component. So it's, a, you know, it's, it's a double dip, boom, boom. And that does take some timing. Uh, you have to get, you know, you have to get the head through the window, uh, so to speak. There are some skills you have to have. And it's one of those things that if, if I'm giving, if I'm giving advice online in this forum, I feel safer telling people to do clean and press. If you're in a gym setting with me, and you want to clean and jerk, you want to do uh, high rep clean and jerks, which is a marvelous training exercise. Uh, I might just say, okay, Joshua, you know, pick up those two bells and let's see what you got. Coach you in real time. If there's an issue, we fix it. I'll say bell down, bell down. There's, let's work on this. But so I think that's part of it. Um, Joshua, I always worry uh, about what I say in my podcast versus what people hear in my podcast. So yeah, I now I like the clean and press better because, you know, 14 year old Danny John told future Danny John that all you ever need to do is the clean and press and squat snatch. Uh, I, I actually wrote that down, <laughs> it was a little different. And, uh, but I've always loved the clean and press because it's such a, I mean, a whole body movement uh, the clean and jerk also is, and you can use more weight and you can do more reps and your points on explosion are very good. So let me just say this, and I'm going to add those two words that everybody online hates. Done correctly, I'm a huge fan of the clean and jerk. Barbell, kettlebell, and even dumbbell. Done correctly. So there you go. Thank you, Joshua, and uh, thanks for sharing that. That's a, that's, a, that's a good thing to know. Josh asks a very short question. Have you ever tried or considered incorporating a two-a-day sessions into an easy strength program? So Josh, if <laughs> TJ said yesterday at the workout, I think it was TJ, um, it was about, you know, about the young versus young, youth versus older, you know, and, you know, at my age now, I, I wish I could go back and tell younger Danny John some of these things. If I go back in time, I would love to have done two easy strength Olympic lifting sessions a day. So, you know, you roll out of bed in the morning, you know, you still got the sleepies in your eye, your breath is horrible. You got your first cup of coffee of the day. You go into your home gym, <sighs> you know, you, I would hang from the bar, sit at the bottom of the gobble squat, have the load ready to go, you know, um, as a warm up. Three sets of three in the clean and press, clean and press, clean and press, clean and press, three rounds. <sighs> Morning session, probably front squat, you know, I don't know, uh, two sets of two, three sets of three, something like that. Snatch, and then go upstairs and start my day. 
afternoon come down, you know, snatch, clean and jerk, front squat, but keep the reps and sets in that, you know, about 10 range, you know, uh, I think it would made great progress. Never miss a lift, never, you know, never even get close to missing and just uh, layer and layer and layer and layer those, you know, those positive makes. Uh, you know, if you're starting off, you know, with uh, 60 kilos on the bar in the morning session, a couple days into it, that's just way too light for three sets of eight. You know, you go to 70, a couple sessions, weeks later, you're at 80, a couple sessions, week later, you're at 90, a couple sessions, <laughs> you're at 100, and that's your way you start your day. Yeah, you're, you're, you're making progress. So, kilos uh, on those. Yeah, I'm, I like the idea uh if all you're oh, if all you're doing is olympic lifting or power lifting or just trying to get stronger it's a good option yeah those two short bouts of training every day would work very well um the nice thing is you know it's why are we such better typists now is because we type so much to communicate uh the more you do something t generally the better you get at it uh, interesting question, Josh. I don't have a book or I don't have any articles on it and I really haven't done it, but you you might be inspiring me to think about it. Uh, with I, I've got an Olympic lifting meet uh, coming up and I'm trying to think of a way to, you know, kind of dose in more training sessions and maybe that's a nice way to do it. Um, a friend of mine online trains up to three times a day in the Olympic lifts doing just the squat snatch and the front squat. Like me, he believes that uh, the clean and jerk stays. It, it's a very sticky lift once you've been an Olympic lifter. Uh, feel free to disagree with that, but you know these are our opinions. But um, you know, three bouts of front squats and three bouts of uh, squat snatches a day would probably keep you, it, he, he had massive personal records doing this. And at the same time, he was losing body weight, body fat specifically. So it's, it, yes, it's doable. It's a good idea. Uh, I haven't really done it, and uh, but you've kind of inspired me to at least think about it more and maybe even and get out there and do it. Of course, it's cold. You know, I don't know if I want to go outside in the snow. Yeah, just joking. But you understand the you know you understand the other issues too. There's great ideas, and then there's application to life. Fun question. Okay, thank you. Will asks our final question today. I use a pronated grip for deadlifts, and uh, and find that uh, and find that around the 315 pound range, my grip gives out well before my legs. So you must be doing uh, higher rep deadlifts. Okay, what would your advice be? I am trying to avoid an alternate grip, but are straps a good a good alternative, or should I just focus on grip strengthening exercises? So the answer on this one is that both are correct. Um, there is a great value in doing grip exercises. When I blew my wrist apart, uh, Mike Rosenberg uh, gifted me uh, a set of thick bars and a couple other things. I also had this weird little thing with all these different sizes on it. And by doing thick bar deadlifts, I, it was interesting because I, with the C grip, and he had, we had a big one. I mean, this... Whatever whatever that would be, I'm, I'm sorry for those listening, I'm, I'm making a massive seat with my hands. My fingers weren't even close to touching on it. I remember when the first time I tried to max on it, I did 265. And then all I did was easy strength it. And I, I think I had like 205 on there, very two sets of five. And within just 22 workouts, I got the 315. And I was shocked at how much stronger my grip was. So... If you're gonna go down the grip strengthening side, I would recommend, and there's a, a lot of brands on it, though I know a couple people who make their own. Um, there is a kind of foam insulation, uh, it's thick, and if you just slice it down like this, you can put it over the bar and use it. There's also brands, one's called Fat Grips, but I think that if you're gonna train grip, train grip in the in the deadlift itself. Now you're gonna find your your, your, your load's gonna have to drop down a whole bunch. One of the reasons I like fat grip deadlifts so much, the thick bar deadlifts so much, 
is you can't have bad technique. If you shoot your hips up too fast, it, you'll miss the lift. Uh, if you don't grind it, if you don't have a steady pull, you'll, they, your hands will drop out. So in one direction, I'm telling you, yeah, try building up your grip strength. Now, let's go to the other argument, which I also think is valid, using straps for deadlifts. Um, we had a guy at our gym who used to make fun of me and Eric because we used straps on high pulls and snatch grip deadlifts. And I can remember Dick would always just, Dick Notmeyer, my coach, would just go, because when you're doing something like high pulls in the Olympic lifts or you're doing snatch grip deadlifts, you know, you're not trying to, you're not worried about your grip on these exercises. You're working on specific qualities. I'm not sure why you're doing all these deadlifts. But if the if the deadlift is more important than the grip, use use the straps. So for me on the snatch grip deadlift, I was trying to increase my pulling power off the bottom. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was also doing one of the best lat exercises I'd ever do in my whole life and one of the best tension exercises I would ever do in my whole life. I didn't, you know, you just don't, you just, you just do the exercise and all these little benefits kind of swim out of it. So this is one of those answers where both the options you gave me were good. And now my suggestion, if you're doing twice a week, I would suggest one day doing a thick bar, however you make it. You probably even wrap a towel around it or something else. Uh, don't go too far. Don't, don't lose your mind too much on this. And the other day, do, the, uh, uh, do it with straps. Um, the thing about deadlifts, there, there are some people who can do deadlift variations five days a week. And then there are some people who can deadlift never and, and, and still have massive deadlifts. So there is some individuality with how we address it. A lot of it has to do with the fact that there's one Olympic bar and it's all the exact same height because of the plates, no matter where you live on the planet. And, you know, if you're having an NBA, you know, five, a center, use it, you know, seven foot four guy, that bar is in a funny place. And if you have somebody who's a, a lot shorter, that bar is in a perfect place. And it just, so, you know, your miles are gonna vary on the deadlift family. Some of us uh, are born hingers. I like to think I am. Some of us are not. So deadlifts are, uh, of all the lifts, deadlifts is the one I kind of see what I'm doing with my head. I'm kind of nodding and going, yeah. it Because so much depends on your body type, your body, your, your limb lengths, and uh, really what you're, you're doing the lift for. Well, that's a I really do want to hear uh, your results on this if you take my advice, okay? Well, thank you so much. Uh, listen, uh, folks, that was episode 241. And uh, great questions today. Really appreciate them. If you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. It's an honor to uh, to allow you to trust me to do this. Um, we continue to grow and expand. And I want to thank all the listeners and all the followers for what you do. If you get a chance, subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, the more people subscribe, it seems the, the more YouTube is, is nicer to me. So I really appreciate it. And until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning.